Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here, anxious to express your worship to the Lord God Almighty at Boone's Creek Christian Church today. We're thrilled that you're here. Please take a moment and fill out the uh, membership and visitor card that you'll find in the back of the pew. And when the offering plates are passed today, we'd appreciate it if you put that card uh, in there uh, as well. I'll tell you, David's sermon today is a very educational sermon. We have a lot to learn from what he's going to be telling us in his message today. You're going to need your thinking caps on. This is not one to listen through passively, and there's an awful lot to learn and apply to our lives. Before we go there, we head into our worship to go to the throne of God to express to him our appreciation for being the almighty one who cares about us. So if you'd stand, please. After my prayer, I ask that you'll join me in a statement of commitment that many of you know, and if you'd like to read it along with us, it's on the front uh, page of the order of worship today. Our Father in heaven, you are almighty, and we believe in you as creator God. We thank you for every action that you have done through the history of mankind to show us who you are, to reveal your love, and to provide the Christ that we worship today as our Savior for the wrong choices that we've made, the bad decisions that we've made, the circumstances that have broken relationships with you that you restored and we celebrate as we have communion with you today at the Lord's table. Almighty God, we turn everything in our lives over to you now, especially our praise as we say together that from this moment on, it's not about me, it's all about Jesus, in his name we pray, amen. Please remain standing. Before the mountains were born, for you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Wait upon the Lord. 
Psalm 73, verses 23 through 26. You hold my right hand, and you guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me up in glory. Whom do I have in heaven but you? The earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread, your very word spoken to me, and I, I'm desperate for you. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread, your very word spoken to me, and I, I'm desperate for you. without you and I I'm desperate for you and I I'm lost without you This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I His chosen people, sons of God through Jesus Christ. I'd like to read from Galatians 26 through 29. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What do you think of when you hear his chosen people? As I contemplated this, I remember thinking that if, if we are the chosen, 
Does it mean that we are already blessed and have little to do? Contemplating a little more, I remembered the feeling that I got when teams were being selected for something that I wanted to participate in, like a sporting event or maybe some activity, and I was chosen. I was generally elated to be chosen. I also remember, after being chosen, feeling a sense of responsibility and commitment. The person performing the selection believed that I could contribute or add value by using my talents. By choosing me, they were providing me the opportunity to share, to be part of a collective body. I feel that we can expand on this very simplified example to being one of God's chosen. Being chosen places a sense of responsibility with us. God has provided us the opportunity to serve, to contribute to his kingdom, to share his love, and to be an example to the world as part of the collective body of Christians with belief in Jesus Christ at the center. As we are presented opportunities, are we using our talents? As we come to this time at the table, we're reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the chosen. Let's reflect during this time on what being chosen means to us and how we can use our talents for the opportunities God presents to us to serve, share, and reflect what it means to know Jesus Christ is our Savior. Father, as we come to this time, we give you thanks that because of your son's sacrifice, we can become one united body, the church. And more importantly, Father, we become your very sons and daughters, your children. Just now we thank you for Christ's commitment, for his willing, willingness to sacrifice himself. And Father, as John has reminded us, May we seek out opportunities to use our talents to further your kingdom. And may we become as committed as Jesus is to our salvation. These things we pray in your son's name. Amen.
Let us now partake of the bread, representing his broken body. And partake of the cup, representing his shed blood for our sins. Father God, we thank you for being in this building this morning, and we thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for choosing us, Father, as your children, not through something that we've done, but through a choice that you've made. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us so very abundantly. Help us now to give a portion of that abundance back to you. All this we ask in your name. Amen.
Take your Bibles, uh, take your Bibles and turn, if you will, to Genesis, the 16th chapter, Genesis 16. And we're going to continue in the story of Abram, and we're nearing the time when he will become Abraham. What we'll look at today is the birth of uh, his first son, Ishmael, through a handmaiden of his wife, Sarah. Uh, and we're going to learn some things there today. So get to... Uh, Turn to Genesis 16, and let's do it like we've been doing it. When you've got it, let me know, and if you need a pew Bible, what number is it on? Ten. Ten. We're still on page ten with only about 700 pages to go, okay? Uh, While the choir's coming down, there's something I need to do. Bubba, come up here just a second, please. You've not done anything now. I just think they need to see Bubba while this story's told. I've heard a story. He and and Margaret Sue just celebrated 50th wedding anniversary. Come on up, and many of you were there for that. And then the family surprised them, and they went, what beach did you go to, Destin? I don't know. (laughs) The Atlantic or the Gulf? Well, it was was west, east. East, okay. Where did you all go, Margaret Sue? (laughs) He was drunk on happiness, right? (laughs) Amelia something. Amelia Island, okay. Now, this is Bubba, who has granddaughters that love to tell stories on him, daughters who love to tell stories on him, son-in-laws who love to tell stories on him. And I just want to ask you publicly in front of all these people standing next to the Lord's table with the Bible right here, <laughs> is it true that you got on a surfboard and rode it? I went as far as here to jail. Okay. <laughs> but you rode a surfboard. I rode a surfboard. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the waves weren't big, big, but I went that far. Okay. Did you hang ten? No, it turned over. Okay. (laughs) The problem was the surfboard was pretty good size, but it wasn't it wasn't built for weight. Okay. (laughs) I'm proud of Bubba. Celebrate his 50th wedding anniversary. 60th, Margaret will have him jump out of a plane. 70th, we'll let him use a parachute. Okay. I want to read the 16th chapter uh, with a couple of historical observations, uh, and then we'll get into this story this morning. We're continuing with Hagar and Ishmael, and uh, some very important things for us to learn this morning, I think. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maid servant named Hagar, so she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Stop. We read that, as I said a few weeks ago in another observation about Abram, from a culture that is sexually saturated. And we hear this as some sort of kinky thing going on, that this man's wife sending another woman. Get rid of that immediately. This was a culturally acceptable practice that a uh, if a child could not be born, and remember when we talked about it, the importance, the overwhelming importance culturally and the overwhelming importance practically of children being born, that if he was to have no child as an heir, uh, it, it was just not an acceptable thing. It was tremendously disappointing. And Sarah recognized that, and she was willing, as was culturally acceptable, for a child to be born through a maidservant. This, in fact, would make that child Sarah's to raise. And so if the maidservant gave birth to a son, Sarah would culturally, it would be acceptable, have a son to raise who would become an heir to uh, the father and would receive the blessings of the father. So that's what's going on. We need to understand that as it begins. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, so this is 10 years after his move, after his walk, after the initial promise had been made, and they'd grown very impatient that a child had not been born yet. Been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. Just mark that she was Egyptian. So the Egyptian culture, Egyptian people predate any Arab people, predate the Jewish nation at this point. Gave her to be husband, uh, gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Now we're going to have the fun put in dysfunctional, okay? Then Sarah said to Abram, 
you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. Maybe he's complacent, but I think Sarah maybe was a little bit hard to live with just from a practical point of view at this point, you know. I planned this, now you're responsible. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. So now they're arguing. Your servant's in your hands, Abram said. That's it, Abram. Stand up and be a man. Your servant's in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. And then Sarah mistreated Hagar, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from, and where are you going? Who's speaking to her? An angel of the Lord. The Lord's speaking to her, okay, through a messenger. And the word angelos or angel means messenger. So the Lord is speaking, dealing directly with her. I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. And then the angel, the messenger of the Lord, told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. And then the angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Now she's getting a promise to her much the same as Abram got. There will be too many of your descendants to count. And the angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now with child, and you will have a son, and you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Just mark that. And I'm going to tell you, time constraints today, we won't. I, I'm going to give you a lot of material today. Uh, we'll discuss some more of it in some studies during the week, but a lot of material, okay? She gave this name um, to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me, for she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. She's seen the Lord, she's saying. That is why the well was called Ber Loa Roa. It's still there between Kadesh and Bered. Now you can go down footnotes probably in most Bibles, and it'll tell you that it means the well of the living one who sees me. We have the Arabic language, or the original language there. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Now, Ishmael means God hears, and he's been told he'll live to the east of all his brothers. Now, I want you to, to think with me for a second. We, we've had a drought, and there's there's a couple of places that there's ponds, or a lot of places that there's ponds on farms, and, and they're sitting in a low area of the farm. They're not spring-fed. There's not a stream, creek, a branch, any words you'd use. They're just low, and they stay full and supply water supply for the animals on the farm from the runoff during a normal rainy time, and we see those in our area all the time. Think of those ponds for a second. They were dry last year, and I've noticed recently some of them are beginning to hold water again because the drought is, we're, we're doing well with our rain this year. I want you to think of the pond. No outlet, no inlet, it's just catching water, okay? And then I want you to think of a branch, a small stream, a creek, whatever word you want to use, up in the mountains, and it comes down and it feeds into a little larger stream of water, we'd call it a creek, and then the creek feeds into a river, the river feeds into a larger river until it goes uh, a lot of areas to the Mississippi, okay, Tennessee, you know, Chucky's, all of these feed, and eventually uh, becomes this great river of fresh water that is flowing all the time, being fed. Now, I mention that because I think in church history and in current history of our faith, Quite often we see things as a pond. And I think if there's one problem in our church today, uh, I was back with the children earlier and, and there was a group going on a journey. They were walking down the hall and they were going on a journey uh, with a rope and they were learning their Bible story and they were part of the journey of the story today. So anyway, um, we, we'll learn those stories, and it may be the story of Abram, and then it may be the story of Zacchaeus, it may be the story of Moses, and then it may be the story of Peter. And we don't see how they interact, and we treat them all as ponds. Sometimes we look at our churches. This pond is Boone's Creek Christian Church, and it's a fairly good-sized pond, but there's other ponds that are bigger and a lot of ponds that are smaller. 
you know. So we look at it all as ponds, and we lose the sight of the river that is flowing, that we're in this journey with God and part of this tremendous flow all through history of God at work with mankind. Does that make sense? So what I want us to see today and reiterate a couple weeks ago, I said we're going on a journey, is I want us to see today in sermon time or today in some teaching time that we're part of this flow of God working in history. So when we talk about Abram, it has a tremendous amount to do with us today. And we're going to see some of that as we go along. Now, we've read the story of Ishmael. Uh, people can debate a lot about you are now with child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael. God hears, for the Lord has heard your mystery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. A lot of historians will tell us that a wild donkey of a man was a descriptive phrase to use of what we would call better ones today, but uh, hunters. And we know later it says he was an archer. People will have differing views of that. Uh, his hand will be against everyone, everyone's hand against him. A lot of people say uh, that that is talking about his protection will be there. He will be in situations where his life will be in danger and he'll be in battle because of this lifestyle. Uh, but he's going to be protected. There's going to be a nation come from that. It's an immediate promise being spoken to Hagar. You decide how you want to see that. I'm going to show you a more recent way it's been looked at, uh, and especially since uh, Israel once again occupied the Israeli land um, in the late 40s by virtue of uh, UN action, and they were given their land in the conflict that's been there ever since. So I want us to start with a family tree. This will be real simple, but I'm going to ask everybody to stay with me and look at this. We start with the father Abram. Now I've got a laser, so I get to use it. There's Abram. Everybody see him? Don't look over there. There's Abram. Abram uh, b conceives, or Hagar conceives. We're coming down this left side of the family tree, and she gives birth to Ishmael. Okay? Then later... Somewhere around 12 or 13 years later, Abram and Sarah conceive. Now, we'll look at that in a few weeks more in detail. But they conceive, and the child of promise is born, which is Isaac. Now, contemporary thought, people will say that through Abram to Hagar to Ishmael is the, the lineage of the Arabs and all the Arab nations or the Arab people today, of which there's several nations. And then from Sarah through Isaac comes the Jewish nation. Now that's uh, the Jews. Now that's very important. I want you to just look at that for a second and understand that. That is how we usually learn this, how it's usually taught. And consequently, we will look at it and say this fracture took place between the two. And the scripture we'll go to to say the fracture took place is where it says, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. He will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Literal translation, he will live to the east of all his brothers. So we read that and we see that and then we begin to understand about the friction that's in the Middle East today between the Jews and between the Arabs. And I remember being in uh, elementary school and in high school having a teacher tell me when OPEC uh, first began, and some of you old enough to remember uh, the gas lines. I do hope we have them again at least one time. I'd like to see some of these teenagers sitting in gas line to get two gallons of gas. Um, but anyway, I remember when we were sitting in those gas lines for several hours so you could get your two gallons. You all, uh, how many of you remember that? And I remember this teacher telling me at the time, I guess it was in high school because I could drive, he said, don't worry ever about OPEC accomplishing anything because they are all of Arab background and they don't get along with each other. And OPEC will always break down. Well, OPEC's done pretty well for themselves. You know, every now and then they've done pretty well for themselves. Now, I want you to look at this because we hold very firm to this in a lot of our teachings. And I want us to understand two things about it, this this fracture that takes place number one be real careful about accepting that whole cell of an explanation of everything that goes on in the world today and i will give you two or three reasons why the first one is there are millions upon millions of arabs who are christians and if we look at it realistically they are beginning to abandon certain countries in the Middle East because of the persecution that's coming toward them, some of which is based on this thinking. 
it's very dangerous to accept this as, as a total view of history because this would in fact give us a God-ordained view of prejudice toward another people's group. Now, who flew in to the buildings in New York? Uh, was it Arab background? And, and we'd say, yes, it was. It was. Does that mean all Arabs are, are hateful of us and hate us? There are millions, and the most conservative estimate is 25 million, somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 million Arabs that are Christians that are suffering today because of their faith and the persecution caught up in all of this conflict. So be real careful about this using this, and, and I'm saying that from my heart because I've heard people use this type of teaching as the ability to have prejudice toward a people's group, and that is very dangerous. Let me make one other observation. Don't throw that out either. Don't throw that out either. If you go in Genesis, uh, and keep in mind we're in this flow, but if you go in Genesis and turn over a couple of more chapters to chapter 21, we see Ishmael of age now. Isaac has been born Ishmael of age. I just mean he's a little bit older. He's probably 12, 13 years older than Isaac. And they've come back and been living there together as a family. Abram loves Ishmael loves him deeply. He is his son. And then when Isaac is born, Sarah gets very upset again and says, my son will never get the attention he needs as long as Ishmael's running around here, and I want, I want him out of the picture. And it says in verse 11 of chapter 21, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. Okay? But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. He's talking about the son Ishmael that distressed him about. He loved him deeply. But listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. It's through Isaac, through the Jewish nation that the offspring will be reckoned. Now, one thing I want you to point out, or I want to point out here is the word offspring is singular. And, and we say we're straying in a nap, but you're going to see in the scripture in a few minutes why that's, that's of tremendous importance. Another word for offspring, and some Bibles will footnote this, is the word seed. Okay? It is through Isaac, right side, that your seed will be reckoned. So be real careful about using this as a basis to say the Arabs are always our enemies. A great number of them are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And also be careful to just throw it out because the opposite thing that can happen is if we say there's absolutely no difference in the offspring, then any God will do. Okay? Now, just keep that in mind. I'm going to tell you in a few minutes personally what I think is a source of tremendous conflict uh, between these two family trees. But I think from, uh, and I'll say personally, uh, we've only got a half hour today, so don't anybody blast me at the door, please. It's a half hour to cover a tremendous amount of material, uh, maybe 35 minutes. But anyway, just, just realize, uh, you know, I'm making it very simple. Don't buy it hook, line, and sinker. It'll give us the basis of prejudice. And don't throw it out. Or it, it leads us to start saying, well, it doesn't matter what faith. Now, as a footnote, uh, I didn't put this up. The Arabs would generally, in our mind, our culture be associated with what religion? Islam. A Muslim is part of the Islamic faith. Okay, So they would be associated with the Islamic faith, which is a religion that was born early in the 7th century, early 600s. Uh, through a prophet, uh, they would say, named Mohammed, who gave them additional views uh, about God and who God is. So they, they're waiting on a Messiah. You can study that on your own. They're waiting on a Messiah to come as prophesied by Mohammed. And they would say that Jesus is a great teacher and a prophet, but he is not uh, the Son of God. And that's the Islamic faith. So remember that. And also remember that the Jews are part of a faith that's Jewish. We would say uh, Judaism. And uh, they are waiting on a Messiah also. They see Jesus as a great teacher, a prophet, but they're waiting on a Messiah to come. Okay? So just, just remember that. that. That becomes an interesting footnote uh, to what is going on with these two lineages that both began around the same time, 13 years apart in the Old Testament. 
The other thing is to be real careful to say Ishmael's the father of all the Arabs. He is the father of some of what we know as Arabs. Uh, the Arab states today have a lot to do with this Islamic faith, conquering much of that area so that even the Egyptian nation today is considered part of the Arab um, uh, states. Uh, and something else that's interesting, just as a footnote, is when you go to the 25th chapter of Genesis, Abraham gets married again. Man never learned. Uh, Sarah died, and I, and I, you know, I mean that humorously, but not disrespectful. But Sarah died, and he married again, and he took another wife whose name was Keturah, and she bore him, and it names these 12 boys. He had boys everywhere before he died. And it names these 12 boys, and their names are Arab, would be considered Arab names today. Uh, at least a good number of them would be considered Arab names today. So it's, it's oversimplifies it to make it all break down in, into this little chart. Another footnote that I think you'll find very interesting Remember, we're in this flow. Do you remember when God spoke to Eve after the fall in the garden? What did he say to Eve? The only conversation he had with her is he spoke a curse on her. And he said, you will bear children in pain. Now, a lot of people talk about that. Does it mean the pain of childbirth, the physical pain, or does it mean the broken hearts of raising children and, and this type of thing? But it was a very short conversation in turn. He just told her, you, he spoke, we would say, a curse on her. Uh, what was his conversation, God's conversation with Sarah, who would be the father of, uh, of I, or the mother of Isaac? His conversation with her was, uh, and, you, and you can look at this one, uh, real quick but the conversation was you laughed and she said I didn't laugh and he said yeah you did and that's his conversation some I didn't realize I'd never realized to uh, doing a lot of reading and studying just working through Abram's life again and preparing this whole series was he spent a lot of time relative to others speaking to Hagar and in speaking to Hagar, when you go into the 16th chapter, listen what he said. Go back to your mistress and Smith. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. And she gave the name to God as she met him. You're the God who sees me. For she said, everything he said to her, uh, verse 7, um, it was the spring. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from? Where? Everything he said to her, which was much more lengthy than the other ladies, is compassionate and kind. Uh, I think that's just important as a footnote to note. And then when you go to Genesis 21, and she has run off again, um, it says that she went away. She was going to watch. She, she sat nearby, bow shot away from her son, uh, because she thought I cannot watch the boy die. They were dying of thirst, and she began to sob. Broken-hearted mother. And verse 17 says, God heard the boy crying, and the angel of the Lord called to Hagar from heaven and said, What's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand. I will make him into a great nation. God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy the drink. God was with the boy as he grew up, and he lived in the desert and became an archer. Uh, so, and then he married an Egyptian. So, God was very compassionate to Hagar, and I think we better be real careful speaking evil of her and her children. I, I just, I believe that as Christians. Now, this will all make more sense as we go along. This will all make more sense as we go along. This is not Sunday morning, just history, and you can agree or disagree with it. I just think these observations need to be made, okay? Now, I want you to turn with me to Galatians. And I'm going to ask you a question as you turn to Galatians, because it's a couple of thousand years later now. Uh, and in our Bibles, 2,000 years later, Christ has come, Christ has been crucified, Christ has resurrected, Christ has gone back to sit at the right hand of the Father. And now we're going to read in Galatians 2,000 years plus after Abraham. Why can we read from Galatians and it have anything to do with Abraham? Go back to the introduction of the sermon, and I pray somebody listen. Why can we read 
from Galatians and it have anything to do with Abraham. The river. We're flowing in this river. It's not just a story back here about Abram and now we're up here all of a sudden in, in a, another time in another place called Galatia. Okay? Now, I want you to understand the background of this and then we're going to read some scripture and all of this will start coming together and I hope it'll do you as it did me and go, wow, this is good. This is good with the implications it has for me personally. Paul had, had been instrumental, obviously, in the church in Galatia as an apostle. And now they're fighting. And the way they're fighting is they are attempting to grab power by destroying the apostle Paul. And so he's under two criticisms in the church at Galatia. It was primarily, just if you count it, Jewish background, but there were Gentiles or Greeks in the church, a good number. And they're arguing among themselves, and the Jews take this argument. Paul wasn't really an apostle like Peter and John. Paul had to defend that quite often. And Paul is coming in here, and he's telling these people, you can become a Christian. Keep in mind, it's the Jews talking. You can become a Christian, and you don't have to be circumcised. You can become a Christian, and you don't have to live under the Old Testament law. Now, we can't have that. If these Greeks are going to become Christians, they've got to, in doing so, become Jewish. Now, look what Paul's doing. He's destroying our way of life, and here he is doing that and attributing it to God. The other side was arguing. This side's saying he's not legalistic enough. You see what they're saying? He doesn't keep the law enough. The other side is arguing, look at this sorry Paul coming in here, and all he wants to talk about is rules. He's given us all these laws we have to follow. My goodness, if we become a Christian, we're supposed to be faithful to our marriages. If we become a Christian, we're supposed to be good fathers to our children. You know, all of this internal change is supposed to take place. And we all know from a Gnostic background that what you do physically has nothing to do with what you do spiritually. And yet he sees the transformation of the mind, sound familiar, as he would teach them, that as your mind's transformed, your life will become different. So here's poor old Paul being accused of being legalistic by one group and not legalistic enough by the other group. What should you do? So Paul writes him a letter. He can't be there. He writes him a letter. But do you see what's happening? Being accused of being one way by another group and the other way by this group. Just opposite accusations flying toward him. So Paul writes a letter about the law, about the promise, promise given to Abraham, and I want us to learn a little bit about it today. And again, we have to go through some things quickly. But let's start in the third chapter, verse 15. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life, just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant, I'm going to say to a human contract that has been duly established, so it is in this case. So it is in this case. Now, I'm talking to one of the Redmond boys, Jacob. Where is Jacob this morning? Is he in here? But I'm talking to Jacob Redmond. And I said, Jacob, I'm going to make a deal with you. We're going to have a contract. Okay? I said, I get a piece of paper out. And he looks at it and gets his father to look at it. And, and the contract says, I will pay Jacob $50 every week to mow my yard. Every week. States that in the contract. I sign it. Jacob signs it. Well, he shows up one Friday and he's not mowed. And he says, I'm here to get my $50. Contract says, I'll get and I said, Jacob, you didn't mow this week. And Jacob says, I didn't have to mow this week. It didn't rain. I came by. I didn't think it needed it, but I want my $50. Well, Jacob, you can't just change the contract. Can't just change it. Or on the other side of the contract, Jacob is doing a great job. He's mowing. He's weeding. The yard looks great. And I call him one, or he shows up one day, and I said, Jacob, I told the neighbor that we'd start taking care of his yard too, and we're going to pay you $50. We're going to split it 25 each, but you start mowing his yard every week too. And Jacob says, no, that's not in the contract. So see, see the illustration Paul's using? Everybody can understand it. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life, just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. And then this starts making a lot of sense because we're in this river, okay? The promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed, singular. Now, why am I making an emphasis of singular? Because look what Paul says next. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person who is 
Who? Christ. I made this promise to Christ. Abram, you, you get to be a branch. You get to be a little creek through which I'll flow. But the promise is made to Christ. Now, he starts tying it all in with this legal stuff. What I mean is this. Now, I want you to ask yourself, what is the promise? The promise was made to Christ. What is the promise? We're going to answer that today. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant. It doesn't tear the contract up previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. What then was the purpose of the law? You know, he's telling one group there was a promise. Now he's going to tell others, let me tell you what the law is about. And look what he says, it was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party. If you have a mediator, they represent both parties talking, don't they? He says, mediator, the law, the angels, they were mediators. But they don't represent just one party. God represents one party. God will do the talking here. Now, I think it's an interesting word. I did some study on verse 19 about transgressions. We are all born in a sinful nature, and so we have laws. Here's some of our laws. Thou shalt not what? Come up with one. Kill. There's a law. Do people still kill? Was there still murder? You know, okay. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Did adultery stop the day that law was written? You don't think so? How about this one? Respect your parents. Be obedient to your parents. Ever known a child's disobedient after the law came? So it says you've got sinful nature. We've got a young lady down here shaking her head no. It also said thou shalt not lie. <laughs> but anyway, you, you've got this law being written. And people are learning as they transgress against the law. And we're slow learners. I can't do it on my own. I can't be righteous on my own. Even if God writes down exactly how he wants it done, we mess up. We mess up. And that's scary. Pops again will change, okay? That's scary. So he says that's what the law did. Do you remember in the New Testament we're told that Jesus was born when the time was right? I want to tell you what part of the time being right was. Man had finally learned he couldn't do it. Man finally learned that he couldn't do it and the time was right. So Jesus came. And that's all the law did was illuminate, turn the light on to our sinful nature. Give us labels for the sins we were committing. It didn't make us any better. It condemned us, Paul would say, because now we know we can't do it on our own. So let's go down to verse 23 for time's sake. We won't read 21 through 22. You can do that. Before the faith came, we were held prisoners by the law. The law just kept telling us we're sinners, we're sinners, we're sinners. Locked up until faith could be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified. Let's go to verse 26. What's the promise? You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You are all sons of God. Jews, Gentiles. You are all sons of God through obedience to the law or ignorance of the law through Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized, don't argue that baptism is not important. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Is there not a scripture that says to the arrogant Jews that were receiving the message, 
if just being a child of Abraham's all that was needed, God could raise up stones. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I am an offspring of Abraham. And I'm an heir to the throne with my brother Jesus. Isn't that exciting? Now, let's go back, Sandy, if you can, to that last slide that uh, shows the break between the two. Now, this is me speaking. I just want you to think about it. I'm going to take preacher privilege a second. I know the Old Testament issues and, and what we've learned in recent history, the teaching of recent history about why they don't get along, the Jews and, and the Arabs. But I want you to hear something real close, real close. We can argue that till we're blue in the face, but I'm not going to carry a faith that says if there ever was a peace worked out, my faith is destroyed. I don't anticipate there being one, but if there was, I don't want my faith destroyed by it. My faith is in Christ. He's where that river runs to. He's where it finally pools into this fresh water as the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as the Son of God. And the promise given to Abraham was, if you have placed your faith in him, could Abraham keep the law? It says no. It was credited. His faith was credited to him as righteousness. His belief was credited to him as righteousness. Now, I believe part of the conflict is you've got non-Christians hating non-Christians. The Jews, as a nation, as an orthodox faith, needs to learn to look past Abraham and Moses and see Christ, whom they've belittled and came and walked among them. And they call him a prophet or a teacher. If he's just a teacher, he's the biggest liar in the world because he said he was the son of God. The Muslim faith needs to look backwards past Muhammad and say you just stepped over the child of God and called him a prophet or a teacher. They're both miss who the Messiah is. And there's not going to be peace if there's not people who agree that Christ is the Son of God. You have a great many Jewish brothers and sisters who are child of the physical promise children of the physical promise but are not our brothers in Christ but there is a great number and a, and a number that's growing and exploding of Jewish brothers and sisters who are fellow heirs with us in Christ as are the Arabs now think about that for a few minutes we were never given the right to hate somebody by any story in the Bible and we were never given the right to discount the role the Jews have played in delivering Christ to us as the Son of God for all men. Now, I want you to go to another scripture, and we, we won't even turn to it just because we're running late. But Peter addresses this in another way. He says to the church, he says to you and me, once you were not a people, but now you are a people belonging to God. And if you'll allow me to say it this way, there's a third people's group that gets involved here. The church. Fellow heirs with Christ. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people belonging to God. And you know what's beautiful about Peter's letter? It wasn't written to the Galatians. It wasn't written to the Corinthians. It was written to Christians in general. It's called a universal letter. We don't side in these battles. We're soldiers of Christ. And there's been all sorts of hatred performed on both sides, and that's horrible. That's horrible. And there's been all sorts of hatred performed claiming God as the reason for it, and that's horrible. One last, one last statement. Uh, maybe this should have come earlier in the sermon. I, I know it should have. Who do we practice prejudice against most often? A foreigner downtrodden and the impoverished what was Hagar a foreigner from Egypt downtrodden a woman in a very patriarchal society and she had nothing if she was cut off from Abraham Sarah's household very poor 
And who did God deal with with tons of compassion that we sometimes go over because we want to dwell on the wild donkeys of man's eye? God loved her. And Abraham loved her. And God protected her. And he protected her little boy. And our prayer needs to be his offspring. Hear the message of Christ from this third group of people called Christians. Maybe we're the mediators more than any president or envoy who doesn't understand the love of Christ. We're to be the mediators. Minister friend told a story one time. The church he was preaching at in Los Angeles is in St. Charles, Missouri now. And he said this scripture came to life to him one day in a very real way. He had baptized a young Jewish girl who was a student at the University or at UCLA, University of California at Los Angeles, a church located right across the street from it. And he had baptized her into Christ a few weeks earlier. He had known her for a year or so of her life. She'd come and talk to him, and she had a deep, she had come here from Israel, she had a very deep anger toward anyone who was Arab. Two or three weeks after she became a Christian, a young Arab girl who had come here from the Middle East to study at UCLA, large student population church, came and accepted Christ as her Savior and was baptized into Christ. And he said he saw what Christ can do when the first person to greet her out of the baptistry hug her with tears in her eyes was the Jewish girl and the Arab girl embracing, kissing one another in the cheek and saying, I love you. That's the story of Christ. That makes us fellow heirs because he came to us as lawbreakers and transgressors and said to every one of us, I love you. That's the message. Now, I've done a lot today with Ishmael. Probably not the direction some think or thought I would go, but that's the direction we went is to leave here knowing we are a chosen people, fellow heirs with Christ, and God loves us deeply. If there's any decision that needs to be made publicly this morning, we're going to sing a closing hymn of invitation. If you need any public decision, I'm going to ask you to come at this time. Please stand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest way, but only lean on Jesus' name. Lord, Christ the soul in whom I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness Before Dick leads us in prayer, uh, we got a call this week from Mr. Verbal, who is assistant principal over at the Boone's Creek Middle School. Uh, they've been adopted by Walmart and by Sam's Club and doing a lot of work. But he called, he apologized, it was the last minute, and we had a team go up to the school at Boone's Creek, and he wanted to know if there was any help could come from this church this Tuesday day or Tuesday evening to wash some walls and do some painting. Everything's 
supplies basically being donated. So we've got a sign-up sheet out on the wall if anybody wants to help. I know it's short notice. I don't say that to give you a ready excuse, but if uh, you're available to do that through our hands and feet ministry, uh, we would love to do that. So uh, is Mike in here somewhere? Mike at another church today for a baptism. I'd forgotten that. So um, if somebody could go, and if I say somebody, nobody will. Somebody volunteer. Scott Buckingham. Scraping the barrel, aren't we? <laughs> go stand at that uh, little place and wave at people and get them to sign up. Just act like you're wanting them to vote for you. None of them did anyway. <laughs> but stand over there. Okay. Thank you all very much. You received that powerful message today of God's inclusion for you in his family of faith. And if you do today, say, I do. I do. Thank you, David, for taking us into the word that way this morning. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, please make the living water that is your spirit refresh and nourish us, each of us, as we seek your face as your church today. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 48, 14. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will lead us eternally. We're going to learn a new closing song as we go. <laughs>